Galatians chapter 6, please. Galatians chapter 6. Starting at verse 1, and we will simply read verse 1. Galatians 6 verse 1 reads, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Amen. Galatians chapter 6. The Galatians had a problem concerning doctrine. And Paul now lets the Galatians know he, he, he didn't expose their fault with them being confused about the law, with them being confused about the righteousness of God, with them being confused about do I have to continue in the law? And Paul made it visibly clear to them that the answer to that was no. But now that these things are obvious and that these things are clear, Paul now tells the individuals, and he calls, us, or he calls them brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual. And what I want us to understand, in the book of Galatians, and throughout the rest of our lives, and in our lives, we have to do things whether we like it or not. And Paul is endorsing and instructing these Galatians and even us today how to confront one another when someone is in a fault concerning doctrinal error, doctrinal issues. We have to confront them. Uh, if you're a parent, if you're a teacher, if you're a leader in any sort, and even if you're an employee, you, nine times out of 10, before you got hired at the place that you now work for, you had what type of process? Start with the letter I. Review, Review and interview, right? And, 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 and nine times out of 10, even after the first interview, Pastor Leroy said it, they call you back for another interview to review and see if you're still interested in just going, they didn't checked up on some of your background references. So, confrontation is necessary and Paul lets us know how we ought to do it. What arose for this study today was at the end of a, maybe about two or three weeks ago, we had awesome comments about confrontation. Awesome comments about, well, it's an individual who I know who they don't understand sound doctrine, they don't understand this point, they don't understand that point. That individual needs to be what? An individual needs to be confronted because they are at fault. But Paul lets us know how we should and how we ought to confront them. And I'm looking here, and what I'm looking at is some of the attributes that we should confront them with. Galatians 5, let's start at verse 22. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Paul says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that now lives and indwells us, those attributes are what we are to approach, the manner that we are to approach individuals with when we explain to them, when we expose to them the truth in the word of God, and we are telling them of their fault and where they went wrong. And we go through it step by step with them. And Paul lets us know that ye, ye which are spiritual, and when you read this, you may say to yourself, okay, well, the spiritual individual should be a meek individual. The spiritual individual, how can I call myself spiritual but still call myself meek? That, that sounds sort of prideful, right? But I want you to come to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 with me. 1 Corinthians 14. 
First of all, the first word we see is brother, and so Paul recognized them as being members of the body of Christ. But he gives us an understanding of who the spiritual individuals are and what a, a, a spiritual individual does know. 1 Corinthians 14, let's go to verse 37. Paul says, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, brethren, there go that word again, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues, let all things be done decently and in order. Maybe about five, six months ago, Pastor Leroy went through the reason for tongues during the transitional, during the temporal period, because the word of God was not fulfilled and complete for the body of Christ at that time. And what was also made known is that if an individual think that they are spiritual, if you think that you are, look at verse 37, let him acknowledge the things which I write on to you. If an individual think that they are spiritual, one of, the, one of the essential aspects of this dispensation is you know why Paul. You know why Paul was separated. You know how Paul was separated. You know where Paul received his doctrine from. So now with us understanding that and with us knowing that, we totally grasp and we totally get that we have to make them aware of their faults, but we have to make them aware, Paul says, in the spirit of meekness, in the spirit of meekness. I want you to come to 1 Timothy with me, chapter 6. <clears throat> Verse 10 and 11. Paul says, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Verse 11, but thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after godliness, faith, love, patience, and what else? And meekness. And look at verse 11. Paul tells us to flee the love of money. Flee the things that will pierce us, that will cause many sorrows. But he says in verse 12, I mean in verse 11, he says, follow after godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Do you understand what that godliness is? We are in to be in pursuit of God-likeness. Mm -hmm. We are to be in pursuit of it. And many people, where they fall short at, is when they think of the word meekness, many people think meekness is just, I'll be quiet and I'll be gentle. And they think it's a synonym for the word being passive. Meekness is, which one of these definitions? Is it waiting for a sufficient time before expressing anger? Not short, but long-tempered? Is it gratitude with understanding of benefits that one have received and who is responsible for those benefits? Or could it be the top one? Displaying the, blend, the, displaying the proper blending of force and gentleness, avoiding unnecessary harshness, yet without compromise. You get it? Meekness is number one. And once again, it's displaying the blend of, look at this word, of force and gentleness, avoiding unnecessary harshness, yet without compromising. And that's where many people fall short when they come to meekness. They love to compromise and they love to be gentle, but meekness understands the proper blend of force and gentleness. Meekness is clear to point out where an individual is wrong, where they went wrong, but you, although you hear their forcefulness, you also, what's visible is their gentleness, and they blend them both beautifully. Come with me to Numbers uh, chapter 12. The Bible says something about Moses. Numbers chapter 12, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. The Bible says something about Moses that deserves for us to 
pay him close attention this morning. Numbers chapter 12. And what we're going to do, we want to just start reading that verse 1. And we're going to continue to read, okay? And it says that Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. What did they do? They spoke against them. They spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, have the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Have he spoken, have he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very what? Was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam, Come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. Now who, who all is present? All three of them. He asked two of them to come forth, okay? When we say all three, we mean Moses, Aaron, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Okay, verse 6. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all my house. With him I will speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore, they then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses. Let's keep reading. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. Now, I said before, in 1 Timothy 6, it tells us to follow after, what was that G word? Godliness. Godlikeness. So, God in number said that he was angry. And we're going to see something further about that. Meekness, once again, is what? The blend of force and gentleness. It's not the absence of anger. That's going to be very essential to understand. It's not nothing gets me mad. I don't get mad about nothing. No, no, no. There are things that should get us upset when they rightfully so should. Continue reading. Verse 10. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto who? Who Aaron talking to? Moses. <laughs> Moses. Who was Moses called? And, 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 and what was Moses called in verse 3? Uh, 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 amen, but in verse 3. Meek. He was called Moses very meek. Let's see how his meekness handled this. Okay? Uh -um. Verse 11. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed, when he cometh out of his mother's womb, Here's the last verse we read. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now. Oh, God, I beseech thee. In verse 1, what did they do? They spoke against Moses. Mm -hmm. Now, what we're doing is looking at an aspect of meekness. Moses, guess what he did not say? When God's anger was kindled against them. God's anger was. They didn't say that Moses was angry at Miriam. And Aaron did it. It said that God was. And listen to what meekness does. Verse 12. Heal her now, O oh God, I beseech thee. That's what meekness also does not do. It, it, it is not. It is not seeking revenge. It is not saying, you know what? You do dirt, you get dirt. What goes around comes around. You had it coming. That's not God, that's not godliness. That, that's not what we're told to pursue. That's not what we're told to pursue. And this is huge for the sake of our confrontation. As ministers of reconciliation, 
we have to confront individuals with the gospel of the grace of God. They have to be confronted. And even to the saved, when they are in error concerning sound doctrine, which Pastor Leroy did such an awesome job of teaching them last week, they have to be what? Confronted with instruction. And it tells us we confront them in what? In love. In love, kindness. But by all means, guess what we do? We confront them. And I say again, what's so popular even right now, this technology age, this technology age, you can talk so much junk over the internet without ever meeting anybody Twitter. You can tweet somebody, you can tweet a Buffalo Bills player if they have a bad game, and, and, and in 10 minutes time, they can read a thousand tweets how people just trash them, trash them. So guess what? This, the, the time that we live in, it's not popular to confront individuals face to face in spirit and meekness. It's popular to see how distant can I be in exposing or telling you what I should tell you. Amen. Amen. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, please. Ephesians chapter 4. Do you know who should, I believe, who should be the greatest confronters for the sake of confrontation, who should, who should be schooling us in all areas? Well, of course, it's the ministers of reconciliation. But next to them, I believe a parent. A parent. A parent should know how to confront their child with meekness all the days of their life. A parent should know how to tell a child with force and with gentleness, and yet not compromising their position. And I say, do you know what sometimes tuck and flip flop? A lot of parents have become so gentle that they're compromising their parenthood. Yeah. That they, 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 they truly are. Sometimes if you watch and if you listen and if you was blind, you would maybe call the child the parent. Yeah. You would maybe call the child. And, 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 and guess what? Meekness is needed for the dispenser and is needed for the receiver. Dispense, we dispense with meekness and we receive instruction with meekness. So we need parents and child to have that, and children to have that spirit of meekness, don't we? Amen. Amen. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, let's read the first three verses. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called with all lowliness and what? Meekness. meekness. With long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Meekness should be alive and at work in the congregation, in the member of the body of Christ. It should be alive. Teachers should be visibly, visibly meek. Now, once again, don't take your eye away from the force. Many individuals, they, 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 they think of meekness and automatically they think of gentleness, they think of kindness. Awesome. Awesome. But they want to leave this out. They want to leave that out. You can't be meek if you come with some force. There are some things that a, that a mother should say to their child that should put the biggest smile on that child's face that an individual will ever saw. And there should be some things that a mother say to a child when that child does wrong that should make that child look like he lost his best friend. It's a beautiful thing when the Holy Spirit of God can give you that assurance and then when we do things that we ought not to, that it grieve us. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. When the Holy Spirit can cause for you to squeeze your pillow and you got you understand the right division and you taking a nap and in your nap you waking up out of your nap just daydreaming about how awesome it is to be sealed and positioned in Christ and then at the same time maybe two or three months later of something that you knew you shouldn't have done, did or said that you and you alone shed in tears because of the sound doctrine that you continually or consistently ignored and put aside. That same, remember this God likeness, it's not coming from you. That's the fruit of the spirit. Mm -hmm. And I say again, it takes understanding to cause a grieving to be present. So we gotta grow. 
we got to grow in our understanding because there should be certain things that when I've seen I did, I'm just smiling. Pastor Scott up here teaching about the comfort that we have, about about the, our resurrect, resurrected bodies that we go receive one day. And I'm just like a, I'm just like a baby in a candy store. <laughs> I'm just all up in it. But at the same time, there maybe should be some times that if I do really present myself at work in a manner that I shouldn't have, I should be troubled. Amen. Know that I'm sealed mm -hmm. with his Holy Spirit, but I should be troubled. And it takes understanding to, 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 for me to be troubled by that. Ignorance don't trouble individuals. Mm -hmm. It, it takes a conscience, amen, mm -hmm. that's filled with some doctrine. Mm -hmm. Okay, come with me to Luke chapter 7. Let's go to when the law was alive and, and working during Christ's earthly ministry. Uh, and, and those of you who, who listening, I, I said that Luke 7, where the law was alive and working, where the middle wall of partition was, was up, and where Jew and Gentile was separated. Luke chapter 7, let's start at verse 36. And we finna, we're going to see something that I believe is necessary for meekness to be visible. And once again, meekness is, is needed. I don't want us to take our eyes off. We're not looking to dodge confrontation. And let's make this, let's make this truly pacific. Confrontation concerning doctrine. If there's one thing that the body of Christ need more of, they need individuals who are not trying to swerve and dodge confrontation for doctrine's sake. We don't look to avoid it, okay? Start at verse 36, Luke 7, verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with them. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. The first thing that we want to recognize about this woman, do you see what the scriptures called her? Wow, come on now, there we go. So what we're seeing is how she's responding to Jesus. We're seeing her response, okay? Um, 39. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him say it, he spake with himself saying, the Pharisee's thinking right now to himself saying, this man if he were a prophet would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him for she is a what? There you go again. I want you to start to look for traits now about this Pharisee. Let's look for some of his traits. And Jesus answering, verse 40, said unto him, Simon, have I somewhat, uh, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. Listen closely. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. Okay, so we got what? We got 500. Who we already, we, we, this, this, this center, I want to point that out. And we go, go ahead and cheat a little. They 10500, 10050. Do they both fall? Yes. They both fall. <laughs> when we cheating right now, I'm pointing out that. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> 42. And when they had how much to pay? And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Let's listen to what the Pharisees say. Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightfully judged. Now, you know what this Pharisee is doing? As you continue on, he's revealing his character, and he's revealing how he views himself when it comes to sin. He, he, he don't understand this, but the scripture is revealing this. Let's continue. 44. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. 
thou givest me no water for my feet, but she had washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, have not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou doest not anoint, but this woman have anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Do you understand the comparison that he's making? Do you totally, do you see what he's telling this Pharisee? First of all, the first thing that he's saying, he's exposing how this woman continually does what? Continually stays at his feet, offer this to him, offer that to him, offer this to him, offer that to him. Pastor, Pastor Leroy, a couple weeks, maybe maybe two months ago, had us turn to also an illustration that we saw that when ten lepers were healed, how one of them came back. How one of them came back. Now, the issue that I want us to keep in mind is, is thankfulness. Thankfulness. When I say thankfulness, this woman understood how great her sins was. The illustration that this parable is revealing of what this Pharisee did not do and what this woman ceased not to stop doing in the presence of the Lord. How he did not acknowledge that he was in the same boat as this sinful woman. Do you know one of the most beautifulest things that Paul say in Romans chapter 3 after he say, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God? But there is no difference. There is no difference. Jew and Gentile, what the law should have had y'all recognize Jew, is there is no difference between you and the Gentile. You are a sinner just as well as the Gentiles are. You need me to forgive you just as well as the Gentiles do. And the law should have enforced your understanding of the need for forgiveness. And being forgiven, you are forgave. And that should produce. But let me help bring up this thankfulness. You see, I believe the word thanks and thankfulness and thank you. We miss it. We truly miss it. Illustration. Nothing in my hand. Somebody's walking in front of me. We're both on our way to go to the bank. They open the bank door. I got nothing in my hand. But yet they hold it open for me to walk in. What do I say by just a, a, a natural courtesy? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did, did I need for him or her to hold that door open for me? Not at all. Not at all. I'm at the store. I'm paying the cashier. My total was twenty dollars and one cent. I got the twenty. I always have quarters, nickels, dimes, I, I, and then pennies. I, I, I have no penny. All I got is this twenty. I'm sad. It's just a penny. Don't worry about it. Thank you. Thank you. It, 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 it's so. But thankfulness that these scriptures are talking about. It's a thankfulness of we understand what was given to us, that benefit, we totally wasn't capable of doing it for Amen. ourselves. Amen. You, see, you see the two different levels of thankfulness? One, it, see, yeah, you opened the door for me. I, I had nothing in my hand. I left weights. I, I, I could have got the door. <laughs> but thanks, though. So, can you let me go a penny? Really? But, and this is where this comes into play. This is the... Now guess what? We're not losing track of how this is the attitude of our confrontation when we're explaining doctrine. Amen. Get this. Thankfulness. Gratitude with understanding. So many people, you know, and, and I don't have anything against Thanksgiving and Thanksgiving holiday. But it's, it's so... It's so generic. Man, it's Thanksgiving. It's, thanks it's so generic. The benefits that they, 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 don't really, they, they don't really get responsible 
for those benefits. You get that? We understand who is responsible for the benefits that we say thank you to. We totally get it. We totally understand it. How about one of these benefits being, and how about we start to use this word more? Not just righteousness, but divine righteousness. You see, Isaiah 64, verse 6, and let's turn there for a moment. Let's turn there for a moment. Isaiah 64, verse 6, once again, time passed. Dealing with the Jew, dealing with the law of Moses, being in full effect. Isaiah 64, verse 6 says concerning Israel, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our what? Amen. Are as filthy rags, and we do, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. When we say thank you, Jesus, we should have reasoning behind those thank yous. And I say again, we understand we receive some benefits, and we understand that we that the benefits that we receive, who's responsible for those benefits? We understand who's responsible for those benefits, and also, guess what else we understand? We understand that we totally would be incapable of receiving divine righteousness on our, on our own. Yeah, you could have grabbed that door by yourself. Yeah, you could have ran to the car or you could have said, you know what, never mind, just, 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 uh, just leave that there, I'll go to the car and get a penny. Yeah, we could have did that, but we couldn't say that concerning divine righteousness. You know what, I got this one, don't worry, I'll be right back. I'm gonna give you some divine right. We, we, we couldn't go there. We couldn't go there with that one. Could not go there with that one. So, in our approach, do you know what this thankfulness does for us? When we truly and totally understand grace through faith without the law. In fact, go to Romans 1. Let's get a couple more verses. Romans 1. So, Isaiah 64 told us what? 64 and 6 told us that we told told Israel that their righteousness was as what? Filthy rags. Filthy rags. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men who hold the truth and what? Unrighteousness. What we do is totally hold the truth and unrighteousness. Left to our lonesome, we would put our human righteousness next to God's divine righteousness, and would it be as equal? Mm -hmm. Or would it be seen as what? Right. It's filthy, yeah. filthy. How about um, Romans, stay in Romans, go to chapter three. After Paul sums up the Jew and the Gentile, what does he say in verse 10? As it is written, there is how many? None, None righteous, no, not one. Amen, now go to verse 21. Paul says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest and be witnessed by the law and the prophets. Guess what, guess what we started to get some? We started, we, we finished starting to say thank you because of verse 25, whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his what? Blood, Blood to declare his righteousness for the remissions of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God keep reading to declare I say at this time his righteousness that he might be just and a justifier of him which believeth in Jesus thank you how about with verse 28 in mind therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thankfulness Thankfulness. Colossians 3, please. And guess what this thankfulness does to you? What did we see with that Pharisee? 
let's call this a level line. Where did that Pharisee see his righteousness and where did he see that sinning woman? Let's say that Pharisee saw his there. Did he see that woman as equal or did he see her below him? He really saw her below him. So guess what thankfulness does when you really understand it? It calls for you to minimize your morality. You catch that? You don't view yourself as being responsible for the righteousness that you have. You don't view yourself as being above who you are coming alongside and confronting. You catch that? And know what's important? It's important for you as you are dispensing out this information about sound doctrine that you keep that on. You keep that meekness on. Let that meekness be on. And I say again, for those of you out there that's listening, maybe some of this is new. You keep saying sound doctrine, right? The vision. And I've been watching some of you guys' teachings. It's going to take meekness. It's going to take meekness for you to receive instruction. Yeah. And that meekness is important for the dispenser and for the receiver. Mm -hmm. Colossians chapter 3, a reason for our thankfulness. Look at verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness. Here is another word that comes with thankfulness. What, what's those three words? Humbleness of mind. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Do you know what is hard for me to receive? Sometimes and I'll be on the job and, and, and some of the guys on the higher up of the ladder will come through and visit the store that I work at. When I see a lack of humbleness of mind, it's sort of, even though maybe the stuff that they're saying is absolutely right, I got to be honest, it'd be a lot easier for me to receive what they're saying if I saw some humility clothed with that, if I saw some meekness clothed with that. True? It, it, I, I'm still, I'm still going to receive it, but it would be a lot easier to receive you telling me I'm wrong if, uh, if you clothed that with some meekness and, and some understanding. And for, and, and for me not to say, like, dude, you really see me down here. You really got yourself up there. It's tough. It's tough to receive that sometimes, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It is. In that manner. Okay, verse 12. Humbleness of mind. There go that M word again. Meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against how many? Mm -hmm. Any. Do you think that sometimes there's some quarrels when we're talking about sound doctrine? When you talking to someone who's been drenched for 30 years, 30 years with never, never hearing rightly divide the word of truth, and, and, and we're instructing them why water baptism is no longer necessary, you're, you, you're using a word they never heard in their life called dispensation. Do you think that it could be some quarreling going on there? Mm -hmm. And get this, I don't deny that, but the one thing that we do want to be careful of Stay forceful, but now here's the other side. Don't forget to stay gentle. Mm -hmm. It's a two-way thing, and, and usually many individuals got a problem with one or the other. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can be so gentle that even when you're rebuking and putting your kids in their place, they know she don't mean that. <laughs> she don't mean that, right? She don't mean that. I'll do that tomorrow. Matter of fact, I'm doing it tomorrow. I'm going, I'm going to where you said I can't go. And they mind, and they convinced, guess what? You would say, didn't I tell you don't go there? She go continue to stay gentle. She ain't gonna never really mean what she said. But it's a balance. It's a balance, and this is where prayer and studying the word takes some effort. Amen. Amen. It's a balance. Verse um, thirteen: If any man have a quarrel against any, even even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on what? Charity. Which is the bond of perfectness. What is charity really concerned with? 1 Corinthians chapter 8 says, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 1 says, knowledge does what? Puffs up. Puffs up. Charity does what? Edify. Edify. Charity is concerned about building not you up, but you up in Christ. Amen. And that produces, guess what? That, that Pharisee would have started doing, guess what, lowering himself. He'd have started lowering himself. Okay? 
can, as we continue to read 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also ye are called in one body and be ye what? Amen. And be ye thankful. You understand what you have put on Christ, this new man. You understand that it was his finished work and faith in that that, that put that on you. That put that on you. And you understand how incapable on your human end with your human righteousness that you could have never accomplished that benefit. You could have never accomplished that benefit. Now what I want us to do, see Paul. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Watch how Paul, Paul finna give us another, something else that we need to hold on to. Let's go to verse 15 and 16. Paul says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save who? Woo, you catch that? Now remember Luke 7, what was that woman called? Mm -hmm. All right. Not, not, not people that's sort of good, but to not to make good, not to make evil people good, but to do what? Make dead people alive. Those sinners, huh? Amen. Paul cut that. Paul understand that. Okay. Uh, end of 15. To save sinners of whom I am what? Chief. How be for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all what? Long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to eternal life. Do you know what meekness and thankfulness Sooner or later, when you really catch that, that God was meek dealing with you. You understand how thankful you should be because of him being responsible for the benefits you perceive. Guess what you understand something about how long-suffering he was with you. Long-suffering, waiting sufficient time before expressing anger, and not short but long-tempered. Now, there is a time where the anger of God, and when you read Revelation, and Pastor Scott, the Wednesdays that I was here, he just do an awesome job about talking about when the wrath of God falls and gets, and gets dispensed on this world. There is a time where long suffering is going to say bye-bye. But that time is not in the dispensation of the grace of God. Amen? So, his meekness produces a thankfulness for you, and this long suffering you guess what else you bring? You bring that to your confrontation when you talk to sound doctrine with individuals. You keep that on the table. Man, you know, it's been five months. I just don't see how you don't see it. I don't see it. God, I mean, man, yeah, I keep going over the same person. How long suffering was God with you? How long suffering was God with me? How long suffering was God? We gotta count thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years. Go and start counting. And in this age of grace and peace, long suffering just keep getting dispensed. Just keep getting dispensed. And I say this, you, especially those of us who understand sound doctrine, let them taste your meekness if possible. Let them taste that you are thankful that they even gave you the half hour that they've given you to share with them. Let them see your long suffering and they still stumbling over water baptism. They stumbling about tithes. They stumbling about the gifts during the transitional period. They stumbling, they stumbling, they stumbling. But guess what? Of uh, they are giving you the time of day? Amen. What more can you ask for? That's what, just give me the time of day. I will thank you, Jesus, night and day. You're like, oh, thank you that they're listening. Thank you that they're listening. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And we just want them to listen. And we want to instruct them to come to the scriptures in a meek manner, to come to the scriptures in a manner of thankfulness. And when you start to go through those Pauline epistles with them, I'm telling you, it's a whole, it's a whole new world. It's a whole new world on the Pauline epistle. It's a whole new world. And you see yourself as less. How much time will say on that camera? Uh, fifteen. Fifteen? Okay, I don't have time, right? Sorry about that, I told you to use it. <laughs> <laughs>
watching this. Okay, come with me to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. So that meekness, we said that thankfulness, that long suffering, it produces what we read in Ephesians 4. Remember it said humbleness of mind? You really start to see yourself small. You, 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 you do, but you see the strength and the power of God excuse me, very, very sufficient and strong. I said uh, 1 Corinthians 15, right? Mm -hmm. Let's start at verse 9. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9. This is Paul writing, for I am the what of the apostles? Please. I am the least of the apostles that I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. You know what he's saying? Not by my education. Not by my knowledge. Not by the pastor that I sit up under. It's awesome to sit up under awesome grace pastors who understand why Paul sound doctrine. But guess what those pastors, and, and this is the beautiful part about Grace Family Bible Church, throw all the glory right back to God. Throw it all right back to God. Verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labor more abundantly than they all. Okay, it's like you're getting pride for Paul. Let's continue to read. Yet not I. Amen. But the grace of God, which was with me. Do you see, although the individual who teaches us how to rightly divide sound doctrine, keep, keep, keep bringing us into mind, yet not I. But pointing you to what? Grace, grace, grace. Man, Ephesians 3. Well, you know what? We, let's go to 2 Corinthians, then Ephesians. We, we, we can move forward that way. 2 Corinthians, go to chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12, after Paul was talking about the thorn in his flesh, and verse 9 says, the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And then you look at verse 11. Paul says, I am become a fool in glory. Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you. Uh, special note, let's pause for a moment. And that's for everybody that's in the dispensation of the grace of God. Everyone who's living, every church should be commending Paul, should be separating his his letters should be endorsing right division and sin. This dispensation of the grace of God to understand how this operates and why we're not under the law any longer and why the Jew is separated and should be commending Paul. And when you commend Paul, guess what you do? You're rightly dividing the scriptures when you don't put Peter and Paul as teaching and proclaiming the same gospel. Amen? Minimum verse 11 for I ought to have been commended of you for nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostle, though I be what? Nothing. nothing. Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 7 and 8. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the, uh, uh, the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of who, who power? His power unto me who am less than the least of how many? All saints. Guess what? This is just how Paul viewed himself. This was Paul's view of himself. This wasn't, this, let me repeat that. This was Paul's view of himself. I can learn, we can learn so much of how we should view ourselves just by reading what Paul is saying right here. He was, he had one on one time, one on one time with the ascended, risen Christ in the heavenly places giving him these doctrines of grace. And this is still how he viewed himself. Oh, man. Eight again, unto me who am less than the least of all seems since this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of grace. I ask, are we concerned enough to confront the unsaved and the saved with sound doctrine? The unsaved and the saved 
with meekness, with thankfulness, with long suffering. Another question. How much time do we spend concerning and questioning ourselves concerning this? What, what, I believe one of the most beautiful things we got is a conscience, and a conscience that questions itself. It's just awesome. It's awesome when you are concerned about what you are convinced about concerning yourself. That's great. Individuals who believe that they're, I am content, I am truly content. How many times have you questioned yourself that if you lack this, or if you lack that, or if you lack this, would that contentment still be present? Question. And when we start to question ourselves, guess what we start to do? We start to be honest, or we start to be dishonest with ourselves. Mm -hmm. Some of you may be watching right now understand maybe sound doctrine like the back of your hand. What you consider yourself as being meek concerning this understanding. You blend the proper force and gentleness. What you consider yourself to truly be thankful as you ought to. Understanding what you received and who was the one who paid and gave his life for you to receive his righteousness. Are you long suffering? Are you, are you easily irritable when you make something clear as day and other individuals can't see it? Clear as day. I don't know how you didn't see that. Are you irritable when someone comes alongside you in meekness and thankfulness and long-suffering? How do you receive it? When someone tells me of a fault, am I irritable? Do I, do I stay silent just because if I don't go back and forth with them, they'll shut up? <laughs> oh, they out there. Is it me? Is it you? Guess what? You have to question yourself concerning these things. When someone come to me the way they ought, and they expose a fault that they are exposing the right manner, the right way, with the right doctrine, do I crave for them to shut up? Or do I receive it with that meekness, with that thankfulness, with long suffering? And thank you for joining us today. Uh, the information is right on your, the bottom of your screen. You got questions, you got comments. Maybe I said something that, you know what? I think you need to think again about what you said. Concerns, call us, contact us by email, by phone. Grace and peace, God bless you.